the topic of the conference, the title of the conference, summarizes very nicely my interest in, in the history of ICTs. I was not trained as a scientist, I was trained as a historian, <laughs> which helps because most people who know about computers don't know anything about the history of computers. <clears throat> and in my 38 years at IBM, I had to worry about contemporary problems and issues, whether it's running an organization or convincing somebody to use ICTs, and to spend a lot of money on it. And when you stare at somebody, an administrative uh, official, and their beautiful baby blue eyes and say, yes, sir, would you please spend a million dollars on my computer? There had better be a very strong story, a compelling case for why ICT should be used. So that brings us to this whole issue, the centrality of uh, computing and administrative operations. So that governed uh, very much the work that I, I had to do as a historian because I came at it not as a technologist but as a, as a manager, as a, as a businessman and therefore was interested in the business and practical applications of information. So then Peter got a hold of me and said, uh, could you uh, provide a, a uh, summary of your work? What... Uh, all the other historians are doing about 150 to 250 historians by my count in the subject area and uh, you have about 45 minutes once you do it. So uh, I've been to Bern before, I like Bern, uh, I was delighted to come here. Uh, so with that, uh, what I'd like to do then today is to really take us through a, a conversation about uh, how computers primarily uh, have influenced uh, uh, the work of, of uh, organizations, of departments, of individuals. And I'm going to do that in a summary fashion, and I'm also going to end up by a discussion of where I think the history of information is going, because it did not start out that way. In the beginning, people studied uh, knowledge, very much the way you would philosophy, wisdom, and then I came along in business and I had to worry about spreadsheets and facts. And that led me to think of other things, and it's in recent years that we've been able to look at uh, additional topics beyond ICT. So let's uh, get right into it. So uh, let us think of this chart as my agenda for today. We have several issues that uh, historians are looking at. Uh, the use of computing and the effects on uh, bureaucratic structures. It's a central issue. Uh, John's book uh, dealing with uh, the, uh, the British government is an example. I did a similar book on the American government, and we were writing our books at the same time, similar issues and concerns as we went along. Uh, we're very interested because that's where ICTs are, are being used, is in, largely in offices and in uh, large institutions. And uh, until the arrival of the PC and then later on of uh, mobile computing, uh, there were large machines, could only be afforded by governments and large organizations, and that's where it sat. Now it's moved out. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I also want to discuss what the challenges are that we historians are facing in dealing with ICTs, because on the one hand, it has a history. On the other hand, we're experiencing the history. And we want to go beyond just simply writing our memoirs of what it was like to use ICTs in our time. Although some historians are now beginning to do that as well. My third uh, topic is uh, we want to take a look at emerging ways of looking at these uh, uses of information and information uh, technologies. Because we're trying to move away now slowly, just at the beginning, of looking at information and discussing the machines less. For many years, we, we were fascinated with these devices and we wrote histories of them and the companies that made them, but now we're trying to move beyond that because nobody in this room buys a computer for the sake of having a computer. You buy it because it, it gives you access to information. 
And since so much of it is digital now, that's how the two topics come together, and that's why we have a different thing to, to move on to. All right. But first, some basics. We don't know how much ICT there is in the world. Now, I'm going to show you several charts. They should all be familiar to you by now. You've seen them in, in different presentations. They all look the same. Uh, usage goes from the lower left-hand corner to the upper right-hand corner. Sometimes the chart looks like this, sometimes it looks like this, but essentially the trend is very clear. In this particular case, uh, uh, one of the things that we do is we look at how much uh, digital storage is used around the world. It's one of the simple things that we can measure. You know, how much storage has been manufactured and sold and used, and you know how much data goes into those, and then you can, you can measure that. It's a simple example to suggest uh, the rapid growth in, uh, in the digitization of information. One study done at the University of California about 10 years ago suggested that 95% of all information in the world at that time was digitized. And yet we all know how much is not. So imagine how much already is. So it's a pretty impressive operation. Let's try another one, another simple example. This particular chart shows the sale of ICT uh, over time. Again, you've seen these charts before. They all look like this. To make it simple, in 1950, there were approximately uh, several dozen computers in the world. Uh, last year, uh, the world had an economy of about 50, uh, billion, uh, 50 trillion uh, euros, and 10% of that worldwide was spent on ICT. Think about that. And it's everywhere. You don't even know how much you're spending on ICTs. Your automobile has ICTs. Uh, kitchen appliances have ICTs. Your tools have ICTs. Your television has ICT. So we don't even know anymore how much it is. But again, the numbers all look the same. It just continues up. Let's try another one. Measures of subscriptions. Uh, we measure how much um, IT there is in the world, how many people are using the Internet. You know, there are more uh, Chinese users of the Internet than there are people who live in all of Europe, from Russia to Scotland. The, the largest, uh, most widely used language on the Internet today is Chinese. English is second. Uh, Spanish is third. It's global. 200 countries are involved. So any measure that you take, regardless of wars, plagues, anything else, uh, it's, it's, perver it's pervasive. Here's another one. Again, a very similar chart. You've seen these uh, in other presentations where the rate of adoption is increasing. The way you read this chart is that um, it took about 100 years for the Western societies to adopt the automobile where 75% of the population had access to it. And every subsequent uh, technology that's come along has come in faster. So, you, you know, as the line goes up like this, this means it goes faster. Now with the Internet, it goes like this. Take a look at your personal experience with digital photography. How long did it take you to go from film to digital cameras? Like that, wasn't it? We all did it. Why? Because we had had the experience with the PC, which took us a little bit longer. Before that, uh, VCRs and microwave ovens. So every time a new digital technology comes along, we do it faster. So not only do we do more of it, but we do it faster and it's distributed. So, uh, and this is all happening while we're quietly going about our work. All of which raises questions and challenges, and they're daunting. So let's, let's go through some of these, because I think they're rather important for the conference. Accessibility. What do we look at as historians when we study the history of, of ICT? Archives? Contemporary newspapers? Do we conduct oral histories? What about secrecy, privacy issues? How do we deal with those? When something is in an archive, like in this building, you can control it. 
You can say, well, we won't let you look at it for 25 years or until the people are dead, so we don't embarrass them. Uh, Snowden gives me all the information I need about uh, U.S. intelligence operations and, and diplomatic cables. And now we find out that Hillary Clinton used her own private server last, you know, two weeks ago uh, when she was Secretary of State. Well, that's against the law. Where is it? A lot of interesting questions. What are our sources? Is it software? Is it tapes with data on it? Um, you probably have here at the archive some uh, digital uh, records that are on uh, medium that can't be read very conveniently unless you were wise enough to save an old PC with floppy, large floppy disks. So real challenges. What about, what do we look at? Documents? We do a great deal of that. Oral histories have become very, very important. Many of the developers and early users of computing are still alive. So there, there have now been well over a thousand uh, very important uh, oral histories that have been done, interviews uh, of these people. Our challenge is that we need about 100,000 of those, and they're dying too fast. Uh, the Swedes have done a very good job in methodically interviewing about uh, 250 people uh, who are early users of uh, computing in Sweden. In Sweden. I'd like to see that done in every country. We've done about 450 in the United States. It's an important source of information. So we have, do we look at machines? And where, and where do we begin? Do we look at the history of machines? Do we look at the history of software? Do we look at institutions? It turns out that in the beginning, in the 1970s, largely, historians began looking at machines the histories of specific machines. And so we have now dozens of histories, fine histories, of how engineers got together and, and invented computers. And then starting in the 1990s, we began to write administrative histories of uh, the use of computers, what we call applications or processes. And we'll talk more about that. Raised lots of questions about what to explore, what methodologies and historical approaches to, to take. Uh, I borrowed heavily from business historians and historians of, ins, of uh, administrative and institutional histories, and also how uh, IT experts uh, normally present information and data to each other. And you'll see a couple of those techniques later on. Lots of questions about what is hardware, what is software? We're, we have not settled as a profession on what constitutes software. You and I have never seen a piece of software, but we spend a lot of money on it, we depend upon it. It affects how we do things. You all have personal experience with that. And uh, if, it, if it works great, you use more of it. If it doesn't work well, you, you avoid it. Then you have all the usual social, economic, administrative issues. And what effect does the evolution of the technology have? This is a rather difficult challenge because you don't always see the, uh, the results. So, for example, when the PC first came out, nobody understood that all of a sudden, overnight, you would have the ability to distribute authority, responsibility, to where it logically ought to be in an enterprise. We did not know that day one. Today we understand that if... Uh, if Guido is, a, is the right person because he has the right knowledge and the right tools that he should make a decision and not his boss, that it should go to him, right? But we did not know that in 1992 or 1982. Now we know. So we're, we're having to evolve as we go along. So one of the things that we learned was that uh, perhaps uh, by looking at processes and administrative processes, we could learn. And look at the questions that they continue to ask. I go to ICT conferences, and these are the questions that come up all the time. Which comes first, chicken or the egg? Is it administrative processes? Do we explore those and how we, computers influence those? Or, uh, like I did, uh, I, I began by looking at uh, administrative processes affecting computing, computing being forced to conform initially to what existing processes there were, 
in support of them. And then only later on, you learn, ah, you know, I can do some other things with a computer I hadn't thought about before. And so I do new things. Managers and economists search for models to explain uh, what to do. And I'm going to show you some models uh, that I've borrowed from economics and from uh, plain old-fashioned management practices. Those of you who are managers will recognize some of them. And I have found them to be useful in examining the role of ICTs. Now, why has the topic of ICTs grown in importance? It must have been more than simply the volume of ICTs that are being used. And it's a question that we haven't really answered. Although, obviously, since everybody's using ICTs, you would say, well, that's the reason. Uh, I'm convinced that there has to be more to it. And we're going to go a little bit through that. But we are learning that ICTs reflect more fundamental issues. And that is, they affect how people work and play. Some of you are taking notes on your, your laptops. You will then uh, take that information and you, and you will uh, build files out of those, which will then port over into your papers or other presentations rather quickly. That happens all the time. Today, you look at your children, they play with their uh, iPhones all day long. They don't play football outside anymore. They, they play games, so they've been changed. Uh, they, they have their screens. Values are being reflected. Uh, new values, as I see them from one country to another, we'll go through some of those. And new consequences are beginning to, to uh, appear. And, and it's the media community, largely the media experts, who have uh, done the greatest amount of work in this area. Uh, they began before uh, the Internet, but uh, the vast majority of the literature and their studies have been about the effects of the Internet. We historians have to take that story back to the 1950s. So in my case, I see myself as an example of uh, my own personal evolution. This chart suggests how I and about 150 to 250 uh, historians have evolved over the last 40 years. It's sort of what I call the money chart. Everything you need to know is on this chart. Um, let's begin in the beginning. I said I started by looking at the business history, things like IBM, NCR, Burroughs, Nixdorf, uh, machine bulls. What did they do? So suppliers of tech and, and their technologies, what did they invent? How did they get it to market? How did they teach you to use it? And why? So we, um, many of us began to do that. The next thing was to learn about how people learned about ICTs. This stuff is complicated. It's expensive. It takes time. And it's disruptive. So they had to learn how to do that through universities, through uh, companies like IBM teaching people how to use things, uh, through communities of practice, software people who grew up with IBM machines teaching other people to use IBM machines and not somebody else's. Same thing with Nixdorf and Cisco and so on. Then uh, we began to look at how industries use ICTs. It turns out that industries are communities. They're like clubs. They're like communities. They're like towns. Uh, they share information. You go to a conference, people show you how they do things. And then if that company uh, does something and he's a competitor of that company, that company borrows from his ideas and then he takes it to the next. So there's, there's a community of practice there worldwide. It turns out well over 150 uh, countries were using computers by the 1980s. Today, everyone does, including the little, little island uh, countries in the Pacific. It became very interesting to take a look at how managers selected ICTs. It's been a subject of a considerable interest to me, both as a manager and as a historian. And I'm going to take you through uh, some of the findings on that, because that actually is directly <coughs> applicable to everything we discussed with regard to administration. And then finally, where we're moving to now is information. That's the real prize for the historian. And that's just starting right now. Along the way, we start out by discussing and studying uh, the history of computing as a very tiny little subject. There weren't that many mainframes. They were locked up in buildings. There were very few people used them. 
But as computing became smaller and distributed, it became a larger event. Millions of people got involved, not thousands, millions. And now we're talking billions. And as that happened, it became mainstream. So while we were an obscure little field of study 25 years ago, today I can stand before many groups and say, if you do not study the history of ICT, you have not, you have not studied what's going on in modern society. And that's all happened in one lifetime. All right. So the key shift was from how ICTs were used in operations of organizations and industries to, to an emphasis on, on useful information. We used to talk about ICTs. In my case, I examined 36 uh, industries to take a look at how ICTs were used. I learned several things. Number one, um, industries tended to uh, copy each other like schools of fish. So all the bankers did the same thing. All the manufacturers of automobiles did the same thing. All the people in insurance uh, companies did the same thing. And they shared uh, information back and forth. Um, they, uh, they did things in incremental fashion and they were specific and that allowed them to make an impact on their business this year. Or maybe next year, but not beyond that. They wanted an immediate impact and they got that. The economists showed them how to increase uh, measures of productivity, usually measured by how much work a laborer could do. Why? Because in the Western world, uh, labor was usually the most important, most expensive uh, component in the operation of any institution. Uh, it was all very practical, but incremental. We'll discuss further why incremental, but essentially the answer is what manager wants to spend 10, uh, 10 million euros when he could just easily spend 1 million euros this year and another million next year and carefully, without risk, uh, transform the organization. So firms and industries changed fundamentally, but in an incremental fashion. But now we increasingly are talking about information, and that's why you could have a conference like this, because it's not about ICTs. They really wanted information, data, better control, quality. ICTs were a way of getting there. If it didn't do that, they didn't want it. If they did it and they didn't get what they wanted, it was an accident, take it out, replace it with something else. The evidence lay in things for the historian in application briefs, articles that said, here's what the Swiss uh, Federal Archives is doing, here's what the National Archives in Washington, D.C. is doing, and then, so then the French Archives wants to do whatever these two are doing. So they would copy each other. And then ICT proposals. One thing that uh, historians have not looked at and I've been quietly collecting these over the years, are the formal proposals produced by companies like IBM to companies saying why you should use this particular machine at this time for what purposes, and here are the benefits you're going to get. And these are usually based on studies of two or three months, something historians will want to take a look at. And as an archive, I would recommend you try and collect those. Uh, growing discussions of ICTs at industry conferences. You cannot go to... Uh, a modern industry conference today, well, certainly since about 1980, worldwide, without having somebody discuss ICTs. It's, it's universal. And so uh, the literature and the documentation is, in, is increasing, and historians are also getting a lot of competition from economists, business professors, and uh, media, and, uh, and, and journalists, all writing about the history of ICT. And so what are we, where are we? Well, we're at the situation where we have an insatiable appetite for information. It's one of my favorite cartoons. Another one of these charts that you've probably seen before. The diffusion of ICTs was so great that the majority of information now is digital. Now, the implications for us all is this. Very difficult to, uh, to uh, store if you're an archivist. They're all going like this, trying to figure out how to do that properly. Will somebody be able to read a digital file 500 years from now? I know a, you can read a document 500 years from now. What do you do with this kind of a phenomena? On the other hand, if it's in digital form, the world is my index. I can search it, I can collate it, I can do research in ways that I could not do before. Very interesting uh, phenomena. So, for the poor historian, we uncovered some fundamental trends. 
When I say we, my generation of uh, historians of computing, let's go through some of these. We learned that companies prefer to implement and invest in increments. It's complicated. It's still complicated. It was even more complicated in the 1950s, 1960s, and 70s. So you get these little incremental, constant infusions of ICT in uh, your processes and in how you run your businesses. Low-risk projects were always very favorable for political and career reasons. You can lose your job if you spend $10 million incorrectly. You will not lose your job if you buy a bad PC. So you try to be conservative. All concentrated on improving internal processes. The only thing you control as managers is your budget and your headcount, your, your, your employee base. That's all. So you optimize those things first. If you get that right, then maybe you do some other things, provide some new services, or go after new markets that you couldn't have done before. Adoptions and improvements were continuous, never ending, one affecting the other, which makes it very challenging for a scholar to take a look at, well, how did a Ford Motor Company change over time? Or Siemens, or ABB. ABB was a customer of mine for many years. We made incremental changes where every day at ABB, we installed some new machine or piece of software, 365 days a year, decade after decade after decade. How do you, how do you monitor that? How do you track that? The best, most effective were, uh, were those that uh, were able to measure and uh, understand how to improve internal operations. External operations were le such as getting customers to come to you. You had less control over that. Also, that we needed to describe how industries were organized and operated. Until ICTs came along, historians really didn't study the role of industries as social communities to a great extent. There are exceptions to what I said, but essentially. But now with ICTs, where, where companies had to collaborate, like in the banking industry, so if you put money in one bank and then you got to transfer it to his account, they had to talk to each other, and the way they talked to each other was through uh, ICTs. So now you have to understand the histories of, of industries as personalities in a society because of ICT. We did not have to do that before. Today you now have to do that. So very, very important to, to understand that today. So historians working on ICT look at departments, they look at organizations, and then they look at, at industries. And they do that both uh, within the national economy and then internationally. So, uh, another finding was that whatever was fashionable in the way of managerial practices, ICTs were brought in to, con to support that. And as that happened, um, the next fashion would come along in part because of the experience with ICTs. And that particularly is the case when you get to the 1970s. In the 1970s, people begin to start looking at work activities as processes, collections of, of tasks that, when combined, allow you to um, carry out a function, such as sell a product, manufacture something, develop a new uh, service. And all those were increasingly computerized, or had com computers involved in some of the steps in those processes. So you began to look at processes. Then uh, as infrastructure, uh, ICT uh, infrastructure spread, you could also redesign uh, large enterprises and break them up into little pieces or into new divisions or, or spread them to other countries uh, rather easily. And then intimately uh, with the, uh, the internet, uh, combining customers, and, uh, and their business partners. You saw an example of that earlier this morning with how uh, now as a user of, of the Federal Archives, you can go online and, and begin to do searches and, and uh, request materials. That's fairly standard now with many archivists. Archives, you can do, uh, I can sit in the middle of the United States and, uh, and look at finding aids from all over the world. 20 years ago, you went to the archive and they sold you a little book. Remember those? 
They don't have those anymore. Everything's online. So an example of that. And now, fast adaptability. By that, what I mean is that we have a terrible problem now. It's an embarrassing problem. And that is our customers <clears throat> are faster users of new technology. And most organizations have to keep up. If you are a professor teaching a class, the students want all the syllabi, they want all the notes, everything on a, on a database somewhere so they can uh, study the night before for the examination from a coffee shop somewhere. They don't want to have to come to your classroom anymore. If you are the Ford Motor Company, you have uh, customers who want to buy automobiles online and they want to talk directly to the developer of the last automobile because they think the knob should not be here, it should be over here. And so they're using mobile applications faster than companies are. A, a big challenge right now for companies is to catch up with their social media strategies. This has been a problem since uh, the uh, spread of the internet where the users, the customers, are the ones who are demanding the changes, whereas before it was the companies and the organizations that did that. So speed is getting to be another problem again. We're back to speed. We learned a couple things also. Uh, those who actually implemented uh, new processes first tended to gain a competitive advantage or some strategic advantage over those who came later. Now that sounds a little counterintuitive. Let me give you an example. Uh, Industry-specific uses of, uh, of ICT uh, play a very important role here. Banking. In the late 1960s, early 1970s, a few companies, a few banks began to put in ATMs. Barclays is probably the most famous in, you know, in England, but there were others, uh, especially in the United States. And those banks had a competitive advantage over all of the banks. You could go to an ATM and get money without, even after the bank was closed. Brilliant. Why wouldn't you do that as a, as a retail uh, consumer of banking? By the mid-1980s, if you were going to start a bank and you didn't have an ATM capability, you couldn't even open a bank. You, you couldn't even get your government to give you a, a license because you, di you didn't even have the basic elements of a, of a retail bank. Uh, there are examples of this in many, many industries. So timing when you uh, use a new application of ICTs is very, very important to remain competitive. Eventually it became business, the way we do it all the way, all the time. And so later on you got an ATM machine in your bank and you go, oh, that's nice. You know, so what's new? It's, it's a minimum requirement for doing business. So the followers would take uh, uh, five to seven years to follow before everybody was doing something. And in s some parts of the world, it could take as long as 10 years. So timing is very, very important. All right. This is supposed to be a funny picture. However, what's sad is that we've all seen offices that look like this, or almost. And I'll be the first one to admit that I have one like this at home. Um, this is a challenge. Because now what happens is that we, we take a look at what is information history? What research questions do we pursue? And you notice, you know, probably in this picture, there's probably a laptop there. Oh, well, we have a telephone, right, over on the left. Um, but we have this problem. Yeah, yeah, there's the telephone, and the file cabinet, and so on. Um, th this is our, still our reality. There was a study done several years ago, uh, published uh, by MIT Press, on uh, the paperless office, and they went around and they uh, looked at uh, Xerox PARC, IBM, Microsoft, and a couple of others, to see what the engineers, the computer scientists were doing. This is what their offices look like. They're pictures in the book. And of course they have their laptops with their post-it notes, you know, all, all the little yellow notes around and the piles of paper and so on. It says something about information and not ICT. All right. User communities uh, fundamentally influence the evolution of uh, 
technology and its uses. So we started by looking at processes because that's what they talked about. How do I process an order? How do I handle traffic jams in a city? How do I launch a rocket to the moon? What is the process I will use to uh, move merchandise from one end of Europe to the other end? How do we do this efficiently? Industry associations play an enormous role in educating people on how to improve their processes and embedded those conversations were the role of ICTs. Large users tended to be the ones who could afford to be pilots, to take risks, and who collaborated and told companies like IBM what they wanted and helped them develop it. So everybody gave feedback to each other. Throw a movement back and forth of employees into different companies. This is something that we're just beginning to study is you take uh, employees in one company who have an expertise and then they migrate over to another company. One of the earliest examples of this uh, were call centers. Telephone companies around the world had call centers long before um, there were computers, you know, they, you know to plug you in. Um, so they, they had a century of experience with call centers. Well, in the 1970s, when companies wanted to have call centers where customers could call in, to place orders and to, and to complain and to ask for services, they had no experience with call centers. So they would hire people from telephone companies who ran call centers in the telephone companies to go do it now in manufacturing companies and in government. So now you can call, a, governments have call centers. And you hope they're not in India. You know, they're, hopefully they speak German or French or what have you. Um, so you have this transfer of skills from one industry to another. Also with ICT, they uh, through the status. Uh, so, and additionally, uh, people uh, would um, increasingly use ICTs, regardless of the size of the enterprise. As computing became more modular in the 1970s and 80s, with first with distributed systems, and then with PCs, and now with uh, apps on phones, you could have increasingly smaller and smaller enterprises. And then, of course, it could all be connected together. So the size of organization by the 1990s did not matter anymore. And uh, instead, people were developing applications, software that was specific to a particular need in a particular niche. And that's how you get to the point where you have now millions of uh, apps that are being developed each year. Millions, not hundreds of thousands, millions. And I think every university student in the United States has developed an app for finding his friends at a bar and are trying to turn that into a business. Now, this is actually a rather important chart for those of us who study organizations, whether they're history or the, or the operations of them. I told you earlier that people incrementally uh, added uh, ICT. What they would do is they would make a, a change of some sort. Maybe it uses ICT, maybe it doesn't. Be a little change. Next year they come along and they make another change. And they change something based on the change that was made last year. And then something happens. Okay. And then the following year they do the same thing. Why? Because they only have this amount of money to spend. Or this amount of authority. Or this amount of risk that they're willing to take in making a change. Or the customers don't want them to make too much of a change or the, or the management above them. So it's incremental. Now, what happens is that you and I read The Economist or Forbes magazine, and they see a, an interview with the president of, of some company, says, oh yeah, we've made a revolution around here. Ten years ago, we made coffee this way. Today, we make coffee this way. And everybody goes, wow, and that's the article that you read, right? What they don't tell you is that from making coffee this way to making coffee that way, they changed the coffee making process 10 times over 10 years. And that's how they made a revolution. So really you should think in terms of how do I make an evolution? And that's what we learned. The problem is how do you document that? Very difficult to do because a lot of these uh, changes were considered minor, trivial, not worthy of documenting. This is not the, you know, the Treaty of Versailles that we're signing here. You know, when we bring IBM in to, uh, to change something, it's just a little bit of, well, we're going to move the, uh, get rid of that little coffee pot. Next year, if you come to the next conference here, that will not be the coffee pot you'll use. It'll be something different. 
So this is how ICTs came into companies and how changes occurred in processes, organizations, financial results, and culture. So very, very difficult. Very difficult for us to study. And yet I would encourage you to try and figure out how to do that. And if you're an archivist, how do you document all those changes? Because at the time they were important. They're very intense. People do exactly what they wanted to do and why. But they only want to do this much at one time. Okay? Why incremental changes? Well, we've discussed these. Often to save expenses, improve productivity, uh, sometimes to improve market share, rarely also once in a while, we, we need to look like we're modern. In the 1950s, you know, they would put computers with their, their tapes going like this right by the window so the cars driving by say, oh, look, UBS, Ooh, very modern, yeah, it's very, very nice. Uh, we don't do that so much today, although sometimes uh, our children will want to get the latest iPhone from Apple because it's smarter looking than last year's model, right? Um, Got to look cool. But everyone sought control and integration. That's the long-term pattern. Consequences became evident. When you look at uh, the business history, you see ICTs generally work in all industries. Those late failed to, we talked about that, uh, uh, the ATM uh, model. It became the way things were done. Can you remember a time when you did not use a PC or a laptop? Those of you who have white hair, remember? A couple of people here who have no hair, remember? Yeah, it's how things are done, incrementally. <laughs> Productivity became measurable thanks to the uh, um, economists and, and business professors gave us tools for doing that. And we wound up with tiers of technology and adoption. Information technology, communications technology, and, and just incrementally building up so that within every enterprise, even in the walls, and Maybe in this building also, you can connect in, into uh, local area land. Um, wouldn't have done that 30 years ago. Next time this building gets renovated, there'll be something else, you know, Wi-Fi or something. You know? This is the way it is. And today, adoption is global and fast. One of the things I, I discovered, I, I recently did, uh, wrote a book on uh, how computers spread around the world. I was shocked. In places that you would never think would have computers, they had computers in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, Yemen, Mongolia. Really? Yes. It's, it, it spread fast, particularly when it became modular. All right. However, historical evidence also suggests other realities. Industries moved to a post-third world, third industrial style way of managing. We talked about that a little bit this morning, become digitally... Uh, dependent style of working. Let me give you one simple example that all managers today routinely use, and that is they won't make a decision without having statistics or data or modeling in front of them. They will go to their spreadsheets. There was a time when there were no spreadsheets, when you used your experience and said, you know, based on my experience, this is the right decision to make. This is a good economic option. Then VisiCalc came along and other, about 3,000 spreadsheet products in the first 10 years of the PC. Now nobody dares to make a decision without, without numbers. In fact, the adjective is dying. You can no longer say this is a great investment. Today you must say it'll give us an 89% return on investment. Then you get your, you get your offer, right? Uh, all major work today operates using ICTs. I challenge you to find any work that isn't done today with some use of ICTs. It's very difficult. You have to think about it a little bit. Even an artist uses ICTs. Very interesting development. All right, so now everybody's doing it. Industries now have to collaborate. And uh, best practices and innovations now also come from industries outside one's own country and uh, one's own uh, area of comfort. So now, as a manager, as a user, you wind up having to look at new places for information. So for example, if you are running an archive, today 
you spend time talking to database managers about, well, what's happening with uh, computers and, and uh, future of data? How are we going to be able to read data? You would not have had those conversations 25 years ago. Today, I, I would assume that you go and you talk to computer vendors and, and computer scientists and, and complain that uh, we don't have the tools that we need to, so that 500 years from now we can read uh, digital records. So it, the pool of information that one has to uh, look at has been increasing. All right, which leads us to what may be one of the newest uh, subfields of history, and that is the history of information. Uh, we haven't really settled on a universal uh, definition of what we mean. Uh, however, we know that it is a very complicated thing because everybody uses the information. So how do, you, how do you define it? How do you document the role and consequence of information in society? We are now asking those questions this year, last year, and in the years to come. There are two journals now devoted to the history of uh, information, and they're struggling with how... You know, what kind of articles should they publish? I'm doing research in that area as well. Uh, but it's, the key is that we will not understand the value of ICTs and how they were used unless we understand the power and value of information. So for my purposes, I have a uh, uh, very simple uh, definition I'm using at the moment. Information are facts, data. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So I want you to hold that idea in your mind. Not philosophy, not knowledge, which includes facts and context, or wisdom, which allows you to see the possibilities. I'm not a philosopher. Facts, data. If I want to get here on the bus, I need some facts. How do I use your bus system or your, or your trolley car system? Facts. But it's very, very essential to understand. And a local boy, you know, down the street. I really like Albert Einstein because you know uh, he did his great work while he was, uh, while he had a regular day job. You know, he was he was a government employee, and then he worked at night. But I had to include him because we're in burn. All right. I have started to look at how Americans used information since the 1870s. Um, why the United States and not Britain or Germany, what have you, it's convenient. But the fact of the matter is much of what I'm learning there, uh, I've, been, I've seen in Germany and Britain and so on in its history. So this is not a, another propaganda for American exclusivity and how great we are. It's just convenient. We also have the advantage of that Americans uh, were a highly literate society very wealthy economy in the 19th century, so they could afford all of this. So I'm examining how people used information in business, government, education, and in their private lives. And in their private lives, these include things like religion, hobbies, politics, uh, community activities, raising children. The most popular, best-selling book in the 20th century in the United States was not the Bible. It was Dr. Spock's book on how to raise babies. Tens of millions of copies. That's America for you. Mothers are going to get the facts. You know, they, they reached out, they grabbed a book and said, all right, chapter one, changing nappies. Here's how you do it. Okay. Ooh. Okay. How do you feed a baby? How do you take care of discipline? And so on. The assumption was that, as in all modern societies, that there were tools out there. Facts could be used as tools. There were tangible things. You could take them off the shelf, if it was a book or a magazine or oral conversation with your next door neighbor, but there, there was something tangible out there. So that's what I'm looking at. So it was very convenient to use the U.S. Uh, so I'm using as my simple definition, and I recommend it to you until you come up with a better one, which is information is largely data facts, and these are seen as independent entities, such as a number or a name. What bus do I need to get over here? What tram do I need, you know? Uh, and that's the one I'll look for. That's, I don't need 
to know the history of public transportation in Bern. I just need to know it's tram number or such and such to get over here by 8.30 in the morning. Right? So it's, it's a factual thing. It evolves over time, means different things to different people. Uh, so that's uh, irritating, but that's the way it is. Ambiguity is uh, something you have to do. And I found people treated information as objects. And everywhere I looked at American society, everywhere I looked, no exceptions, this was true. Now, part of it is that phenomenon of when you buy a new car. You buy a Mercedes-Benz. You drive it out a lot. You get out on the highway and you look around and you go, oh my goodness, look, everybody's got a Mercedes-Benz. And then two weeks later, you don't notice it. I noticed it when my wife was pregnant. Every time my wife was pregnant, I thought every other woman in America was pregnant. Because I noticed it, because it was conscious to me at that moment. Well, this is what's happening to me now with information. It's, there are no exceptions. Everybody in America was using facts. They were tangible, treating it as a tool. Okay. I also discovered that uh, its value works best within an information ecosystem. Think of uh, the jungle, you know, with plants and, and bugs and, and trees, and, and they all rely on each other. Well, that's the same thing. You can do this with information. Identify the various groups of people using information that they share or interact with, and then you can trace facts as they move from one to another. Now, you don't have to worry about the details, but you can see, you know, like schools and universities, uh, they also interact with gossip and uh, news and friends. You get uh, also industrial associations uh, work with K through 12 and so on and so forth. And so you can see that you can document with some little technique like this, a very simple one, where information moves about, who has it, who generates it, where does it go, who uses it, in what format, where is it stored. And you can build this for an industry, you can do it for your own private lives, you can do it for a profession. It's just a handy little way of, of beginning to take something that's ambiguous. You can do it at the institutional level. Here's an example from Hitachi Corporation. This is actually a historical example. Hitachi talked to these various other organizations on a regular basis. They shared information back and forth. Very specific information. So when Hitachi talked to Hitachi America, there were specific pieces of data that they wanted, that they sent down, and that they also got back up. And you could document who used it and why, and the effect it had on the political and uh, business relationships between the two enterprises. So you can build something like this for the subject that you're looking at. Look at another example. Over time, Americans structured use of information to understand their world. Here are phases in corporate and government uses of the Internet since 1994. I identified four phases. It's not important to go through the detail, but it starts out with initial adoption and ends up where everybody's using social media. I identified four phases based on the volume of activity, put a date on it, what were the practices that they had over time, and examples of participating industries uh, getting involved. You could do this for your own country if you want to do it on a national basis. And then within each one you can put specific examples and document the inventory of information being used. I said earlier that uh, uh, historians and uh, managers uh, share a common uh, fascination with processes. Here's an example of classic supply chain, probably the most widely used process in uh, the private sector where you make something and eventually you sell it, and you have steps along the way, and wherever your role is, you, you try to optimize the efficiency of your piece of it, or if you're lousy at it, you're poor at it, you, you let somebody else do it for you. So you tighten up the, uh, from, from planning to uh, servicing of a, of a product, you improve the efficiency of it. The example I always like to use is the engagement ring. The engagement ring begins in a mine in, in uh, South Africa where somebody digs out a, a diamond. Then it goes to Amsterdam where it gets cut. Then it goes to New York to go into a jewelry store. Then we got to go find somebody who's in love, who buys a ring, gives it to his uh, fiancée, who accepts his uh, proposal for marriage, and then they get married. 
And then somebody has to do a study to find out how many people actually uh, got married or how many people are falling in love so they can tell the miners how many more diamonds to dig out of the ground. There's a f whole formal process for that. And each one has information associated with it. So you can set up a process map like this and then document the information that you need while the manager is trying to reduce the cost and increase the speed with which all this gets done. You as a historian can uh, document this ambiguous thing called information. Well, it turns out when you do that, you can uh, build uh, ecosystems that are specific to an industry or profession. This one happens to be an industry and its members. Most industries have firms, associations, customers, centers of expertise, like a university and regulators, right? That's a, a generic model for an industry. So if you want to take a look at uh, um, information in the, uh, in the watch industry, let's say the Swiss uh, watch industry, you'd, you'd find firms, associations, customers, centers of expertise, and regulators. You can do this for any country. I found it very convenient to do that for the Americans. And then we get to infrastructure. You cannot get away without infrastructure. It comes in two flavors, two types, the two components. There's a physical infrastructure. And here, let me caution you. ICTs do not operate in isolation. If you go to work tomorrow morning and you watch what happens in your building, you're going to notice two things. Number one, that everybody's on their terminals, right, using ICTs. And the mailman comes to the door with a, a bunch of envelopes. And somebody walks in and drops something else on your desk. Now you've got three sets of infrastructures all working simultaneously, such as railroads, trucks, telegraph, newspapers, books, telephones. You have that part of it. And the other part, then, is the content, reports, data, spreadsheets, narratives. They work simultaneously together. These are specific to all organizations. These are... Uh, Normally, sufficiently documented for historians. Once you look for a model like this, you will find the evidence. It's very clear. And they reflect much on the work of, of the individuals involved. So a very convenient way of, of, uh, of looking at the flow of information. Uh, here's another example. This is uh, a lot of these models are drawn from business and economics. Historians don't tend to draw pictures. I find they're very useful when it comes to the information history. This one happens to be, um, you have hierarchy. Some industries are more important. Some individuals are more important, less important. So it, it's helpful uh, to understand hierarchies because information is influenced by who it comes from. So when the director of, of the Swiss Archives sends you a piece of inf information and you're an employee, you're going to hopefully pay more attention to it, yes? Yes, then if poor Guido sends it to you, right? But because you're a good manager, you'll accept his information. But you're, you're the manager, so you fit a little, a little bit more important through the culture uh, uh, of how you run a business or any enterprise. So you have the same thing with firms. You have the same thing with industries. Some industries are more important in a country than another. Watch industry and banking in, in this country, very, very important. Watch industry in the United States, not so important. Okay, so another, uh, another method of doing that. Um, I did a study a couple years ago taking a look at diplomats. Uh, diplomats are, are the most litigious, document-oriented uh, profession you can almost find other than lawyers and doctors. And so I, I took a look, in this case, the Spanish uh, diplomats who were very much like the French and the British and so on, very common in their practices. And these arrows indicate the various agencies involved in a hierarchy, beginning down at the embassies and the consulates and then going all the way up to the ministry in Madrid. And how information in general flowed back and forth, the reports, the kind of data that went back and forth. Fascinating. You can do this for any profession, for any industry. Very helpful technique. This became the central chart of my study of what was going on. Very useful. And look at all the participants down at the bottom. You have journalists, lawyers, professors, historians, politicians, military experts, all these people involved. All right. Characteristics of an information ecosystem are beginning to emerge now that we can uh, study. How are we doing on time? Are we okay? 
Okay. All right. So a couple of uh, suggestions. There are, you want to work on uh, understanding the forms of information. This is what I'm learning, such as laws, medical facts, accounting. You want to pay attention to organizational infrastructures because they affect the speed with which information flows and where they go. Obviously, the artifacts are important, books, magazines, and reports, file cabinets, three-by-five cards, notebooks. But remember, that's only a small piece of the story, right? Who distributes this information? It's not always obvious. I like book dealers, websites, management, my next-door neighbor. Document those. It's amazing how many there are and how accessible and affordable these things are. So I think those are com uh, elements that provide some of the characteristics of studying information today. And it's all happening at the same time. This list uh, is simply an example of the variety of sources of information that you can find. Everything from census and social data and economic statistics all the way to the information artifacts. Computers, number and size of libraries, number of patents, copyrights, reports, communication statistics, number of books published. It's very complicated. The evidence makes it possible to observe the types of uses of information, however, and that's the good news of that complexity of those sources. So you can look at it by institution, and you can look at it by activities and topics. My favorite on the institutional side is profession. If you have doubts as to the scope of a research project or what you should be examining, begin with the profession. It's the easiest. Whether you're a professor or a doctor or a lawyer or an archivist, business manager, it's the easiest. Activities, work activities, child rearing hobbies. I mean, you can pick any activity that people spend time on and you will find information underneath that in support of it and an infrastructure that supports that as well. All right, in summary, what am I learning? A shift is underway from the studies of just ICTs to the history of information and its uses. From the study of ICTs to the study of information. But you cannot study information without understanding the effect of ICTs today. That's a very powerful statement to make. This is why studying ICTs continues to be very, very important. We're moving from simply the supply side, which is who produces information, to the demand side, who uses it, to larger audience. From counting machines to understanding results. Results can only be measured by how you use information. From just looking at histories of processes to also the information and how it changed how people did their work, how they played, and the attitudes. It's, it's becoming complicated again. Uh, just as it was when we, when we were studying ICTs alone. But as I have hopefully uh, demonstrated today, you can add some structure around this general question of information processes. So on that note, I want to ask if... Are there any questions?